Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful. And for the faithful, I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Excellent. I got a couple episodes of uh, Jack Reacher to watch. Oh, yeah? Which is a the world's dumbest show, but I love it anyway. Jack Reacher? <laughs> yeah, it's on Amazon. Oh, yeah. Have you never seen Jack Reacher? No, we don't have Amazon. So. Never hear of that sh- series? Talk heard to heard of it. Reacher movies, anyway. It's, yeah, mm-hmm. it's Anyway, I get a kick out of it. And, of course, the Oilers won 5-2 over the Philadelphia Flyers. Another big win, Bruce, are now. Um, I, last time I checked, Arizona lost. They were trailing. And... Um, Four to one final. Okay. So the Oilers are one point behind Arizona now for the final wild card spot with a game in hand. So they have they uh, this is the second time now that they fought their way back. Did they actually tie for the playoff spot last time? Uh, I think they got in by percentage and they were uh, um, out by points because they got fewer games played. Yeah. This time well, same, they're same, same thing. holes now, yeah. yeah. They're at 557 and Arizona's at 556. Okay. So so yeah, so they're in theory they're in the wild card spot right now. Um but it's decided by points of course. So they're still one point back and they've got a game in hand. And they're um four points back of Nashville and they have uh, two games in hand, or three games in hand, I should say. So very promising. You know, they've had, a, of course, a big winning streak here. Is it what is it? Six now, Bruce. Six now. Wow, six, six games now. after eight before they. This one is eight, a, lost three, mm-hmm. all in regulation. Then one six. Yeah. So. Of course, they have been a dominant team pretty much since Knobloch took over. They've just been absolutely dominating at even strength. And tonight they got a big power play goal uh, in the victory over the Philadelphia Flyers. Bruce, this is our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast. We also have one conundrum. What's your good thing? Well, I think yours is before mine, so for both good and bad. So why don't you go first? All right. Uh, my good thing. Oh, okay. Uh, so the Oilers got up to nothing. Um, and it looked like they were cruising in this game. And then they gave away a couple goals. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But, um, as was pointed out on the broadcast by, uh, Louis DeBrusque and Jack Michaels, the turning point of the game was when they, they got a power play late in the third period. And did they ever go to work? They made a. There was a few players there who had uh, committed sins on the two goals against, but they sure uh, were working their butts off on the power play, and they made some absolutely great plays. Of course, McDavid had five points on the night, and one. So he was in on every single goal, and he was in on this one. But it was really highlighted by a couple battles won on the boards to keep the puck in. Leon Dreisaitl made a just great uh, play, battling hard on the left boards near the blue line to keep it in. Looked like it was coming out for sure, and he just reached yep. out with his big s- stick and uh, a big pitch fork <laughs> and, uh, and pulled it away from the Arizona player who was breaking out and whipped it across the ice where McDavid picked it up. Um, McDavid made kind of a, I think the puck went around and they almost scored then, and then there was a weak, kind of a weak pass by McDavid back to Bouchard, and he took a gamble and make, went for the, uh, to keep it in. And he kept it in. Travis Konechny was coming up and he got his skates against the boards, did Bouchard. And Konechny couldn't get it out. Bouchard kept it in. Um, and uh, good things happened from there. The puck went down low to Hyman behind the net, who held it for a little bit, waited for the play to, to develop. McDavid came charging into the slot then and got Hyman's pass. And McDavid just made an absolutely as he was moving, beautiful pass to Nugent Hopkins, who slammed it in the net. In fact, in some ways, Nugent Hopkins had the easiest time of it of anyone 
on that. Uh, he had the most rote play uh, in mm -hmm. that entire sequence. But it was a huge goal with um, after the Flyers had come back, tied at 2-2, you're in the last minute of the period, which is always a terrible time to give up a goal. Terrible to give up a goal when you're when you're battling back and you've worked so hard to get back in the game. Yeah. And uh, you've done so. And they score a power play goal. So the great, great play by the orders and a much needed power play goal they've been winning on even strength goals interesting bruce interestingly bruce but uh this there tonight they won it in a in, in a big moment on the power mm -hmm. play yeah and, and they clinched it on a quasi power play which is my good thing uh which was the 4-2 goal early in the third period at the 127 mark and this was one where the um the dry saddle line was out and controlling play rather well in the uh, Philadelphia end of the ice. And Warren Fogle got, I think he got high sticked as he was trying to make a thrust on net and the ref's arm went up. That was at 1911. Uh, so that was 38 seconds before the eventual goal went in. So, uh, from that moment, the Oilers retained possession of the puck. They made 13 passes, uh, several of cross-ice variety, uh, and they just whipped it around. And it was the uh, Dreisaitl, Fogel, McLeod line with uh, Nurse and Cece, and, of course, McDavid, who hopped over the boards. And so for all that, it was... It was um, not the regular power play. The two main guys were out there. And the two main guys were the ones who finished the play. But there were some good plays before. McLeod made a good play to control the puck right away on the sideboards to basically get that cycle started and give David time to join. And then they were just whipping the puck around, skating around. They really had their skating legs going. And finally, they were able to set up a play on the right side of the ice where CC touched it over to uh, McDavid and he circled high in the zone and around the left circle and then pulled a pass back. You and I probably knew it was coming. I'm not sure Philly did, but the exact timing of the of the pulled back pass to Dreisaitl. And Leon, for, for a rare change, uh, rather than his normal executioner's shot, where he basically s starts the shot from the puck he just brings a stick down right behind the puck and shoots. This was an actual slap shot by by Dreisaitl, like a wind-up one time. And he got all of it. What a bomb. And he just blew it past Connor Hart from probably 35 feet, but it was a rocket. And, of course, Hart was moving because he was trying to track McDavid, who was moving all night. And uh, it wound up being a... Uh, uh, just a thing of beauty, but I, I actually enjoyed the, you know, the control. At one point I was saying to my wife, I said, you know, they might as well just play six on five and kill the clock. They've got the lead, right? It's just while away the whole third period on the six on five. And instead they did the next best, best thing, which was score to make it four to. And then uh, they were kind of off to the races after that. Just a, a beautiful goal and some great I thought veteran composure by the six Oilers that were on the ice. Just counting up something here, Bruce. For so that was Leon's first goal off one timer at even strength this year. Mm -hmm. And it was still kind of a power play, but he, yeah, it was an X, <laughs> yeah. And he's had. Um, his eighth, that was his eighth one-timer at even strength. He's had 21 one-timers on the power play. He scored four times. That's so, low for him. Five for 29. That is low. He usually shoots those in at about 36, 37 percent, his one-timer shots. So <laughs> it's interesting. The orders have battled back and are now right in contention again. And the power play has been good, but not great. So um, hopefully if we get a great power play, we'll even, the orders can even crank it up higher. Uh, yeah. Okay, my uh, my bad thing, Bruce, I'll start here as well because my bad things comes first. And it's the first goal against the Oilers are up 2 nothing in the second period, um, 12 minutes or 11 minutes in. And this is an issue that plagues every hockey team at some point or other. 
Um, but it's a particular issue for the Edmonton Oilers. When they let in goals against because of what I'll call a lack of urgency, um, you could call it undisciplined play would be another way of putting it. Because the discipline is to have the urgency. The discipline yeah. is is you've made a, you've developed the habits yeah. over time where you're always going hard on defense and you're always mm-hmm. doing the right thing on defense. And mm-hmm. in this play, a number of players didn't do that. So it's a two nothing lead. And what does Zach Hyman do? He tries a back back pass without really being completely sure where the player is in the offensive zone. And he you know back pass um, and it goes to the other team and they're breaking up the other direction. Evan Bouchard then kind of he's he was the back pass was intended for Bouchard and he kind of wanders into the play, and instead of like as, as soon as he loses that battle, instead of hustling back as hard as he possibly can, <laughs> Evan Bouchard decides, well, I'm just just going to go back kind of s- slowly. I'm going to meander back to my own zone, and this is one of those moments where the knives come out from all the Bouchard haters. In the uh, oil country, there are fewer in number these days. I might know it, but few, fewer in velocity. But they're in, still in, there. <laughs> they're fewer in um, speaking out. They're still yeah. there, but they're not speaking out as much. But that they might have had. They were. They had a little moment there where they thought, "Yes, I've justified in my hatred of this player because he does these things." Well, he he did do that thing in that moment, mm-hmm. and um, so he 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 goes back slowly. But if you also watch that play, you'll also see a pretty lame back check from Connor McDavid, truth be yep. told. Five point night for Connor McDavid, but man, mm-hmm. did he dog it back on that play. Yep. And, and um, for him tonight, if I was grading because of that play. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Nine, yeah, I agree. For sure, nine. But. Nine. It's not, no, you can't make that back check, non back check. And again, these are all just habits mm-hmm. from each of these three players. You know, you're protecting a lead. Maybe you you more conservative from Hyman you, and Bouchard and McDavid. You just you just get mm-hmm. back. This is what you do every time. You don't even think about it. You just do it because mm-hmm. that's how it's done. And then there's a Ekholm is the least culpable. He he allows the pass through. Might have been nice to get that two on one pass, but it's you know that's a hard play mm-hmm. to make. And there's a breakaway in there and and a goal scored. So that's that was bad, bad, bad. In Bouchard's defense which are two words that can go together. Uh, and Bouchard's defense on that play, he uh, uh, once he, he committed to trying to receive the pass, and he was kind of caught in no man's land. And his decision to me wasn't lollygag back, but actually to front the pass. Like he saw, there's somebody behind me, I'm going to intercept this pass. And the crafty veteran, Sean Couturier, uh, uh, was able to get it past him by lobbing him. It was a great pass. He put it right up into the, you know, way up where Bouchard couldn't get it. And when it came down, there was two flyers and only one oiler left. And this is where if McDavid had been really, you know, hauling ass on the back check, he could have got in there and 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 broke that up. But uh, he kind of was in passenger watch what happens in front of me mode. And it wound up being kind of a slow developing two on one, and that's sure was. you know that was the problem. Like it was a two on one, but they could have canceled it if somebody was was busting butt coming back, and 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 it just didn't happen. And uh, uh, the very nifty Travis Konechny was able to once the puck got chipped through to him, he made no mistake pulling the puck to his forehand and putting it right in the top corner. So more of a mental error than from Bouchard or a judgment error. Mm-hmm. Um, than a uh, than him being um, lackadaisical, perhaps, right. as well, opposed like, to McDavid, who doesn't have that excuse on the play. I'd right. liken it to the tennis player who's you know at the net and he's he's trying to you know pick off the passing sure. shot on, on one side or the other and he's ready for that and then the guy just lobs him perfectly over his head and all you can do is watch and to a certain point say, "Nice play, Sean Couturier. You took advantage of that situation beautifully." Who's so. famous for lob shots in tennis? Nadal? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I don't even know tennis. I don't watch tennis, so I can't mm-hmm. say. Bruce, what is your bad thing? Yeah. Well, I'm tempted to hammer on Evan Bouchard for that horrible breakaway with like six minutes to go. You convinced me it was garbage time. By then it was 5-2, <laughs> and it seems to me the last thing you want to do is give the other team a breakaway when you have a comfortable three-goal lead by... Uh, uh, being a little little uh, lax at the blue line. Again, I think it was Sean Couturier who got the better of him. Uh, but I won't. Uh, I'll just go 
segue directly to the second Philadelphia goal, which came only uh, six minutes after the first one, that that 2 nothing lead evaporated entirely. And again, it was a play of just lax back-checking in the neutral zone. Like when Philly came out, I thought, it's three on four. There's nothing here. Except for McLeod was over by the boards, by the penalty box. So he wasn't really in the middle of the ice. But he was a little bit ahead of Drysaddle. And Drysaddle kind of pulled up saying, well, I'm the second forward back. So I should be watching for trailers and stuff. And in the end, neither forward really got into the play. And Philly was able to execute from there because they had the extra man. And the extra man turned out to be Mark Stahl steaming up from left defenseman at his top speed of four miles an hour. And somehow he got behind everybody on the artist because he was skating and they weren't. He wasn't skating very fast, but he was skating. And then his shot beat Skinner and, uh, uh, you know, he did hit the hole from fairly close range. And it was, you know, a play where there was lots of options. I think Skinner would probably think he might have had that one. But because it, but it, you know, it was it wasn't his fault. But he might have been able to put out that fire. And he just, I think he got a piece of it with his glove, and it bounced down and in. But uh, Skinner was about the least culpable on the play, and and it was uh, that was CC and Nurse that got uh, that got lit up on that on that goal. So both of the top two pairings had their moments on the, on yeah, the top two on the top two lines all. You know, all ten players in the top top two units uh, were on for a goal against. Yeah, I, I think the defense were the least culpable. The the, the back check from Drysaddle and McLeod um, again it wasn't good enough. It's just it's just it's one of those things where it shouldn't you shouldn't have to decide you're going to do it. Yeah, yeah just you should do just it. always do it. The puck's going yeah. to your end. What do you do? Mm-hmm. You always just this is how you play hockey. You just go. You get back as fast as you can to help out. And they don't. You know, they don't. And this, um, you know, it's a 5-2 win. McDavid had five points. There's so much there on a big six-game winning streak. Mm -hmm. But that's the habit that you don't have in the playoffs when you need it. That's the habit where Vegas scores in game six two goals because you're late going to the front of the net because that's what you do. So this is why we're – this is why this year especially – of course, we're all, I'm always kind of on this, but this year especially, I just think it's it's got to sink in. Like, make it your habit right now. So in the playoffs, when you want to win the Stanley Cup, uh, in the, what is it, Stanley Cup or bust season, that you don't bust, that you actually win mm-hmm. the Cup. Because this team can win the Stanley Cup. This is an excellent hockey team. Um, they had a weird start to the year, but they, they, they've they come around. They're back in it. Uh, but they won't win the Stanley Cup if they don't change that habit. And mm-hmm. so we're going to be keep, we're going to keep watching for it this year and see if there's any improvement. I actually think there has been improvement, some improvement, but it still uh, pops up. And maybe it's going to in the 82 game season. Maybe if you watch like the team I always go back to is the Islanders of the early 80s, where the back checking was so intense and ferocious. But maybe if you watched all those games, went back and watched them all, you'd see instances during the long, boring regular season when oh, yeah. there was also slack moments. But that's what I remember when they came to Edmonton in the regular season and the first time I ever saw that team play. I was just astonished by the intensity of the back check. Islanders. And other teams, yeah, the Islanders. And other teams do that as well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and that Islanders team was just f- ferociously competitive and, and they were drilled. And that was their habit. They just didn't, it wasn't a matter of choice. They did it every single time the puck went the other way. I remember in, live in person being astonished at how hard Brian Trache hit people. Yeah, he didn't yeah. just finish checks. He boomed guys hard. Man, he was a mean, tough guy and and a great playmaker. Like the great playmaking and scoring and stuff is what I was watching for. And I, I just got a real two eyes full of a complete game that that guy had. What a player! And they were, uh, they did not fool around at that point. And uh, they, you know, I'm sure you're right that there was there'd be times, but. Uh, uh, I'll say this about tonight's win. The Oilers, this wasn't the Sharks or Ducks that they were handling tonight. The Flyers are a good team. I thought they they played hard. They gave Edmonton a really good game. Luckily, their power plays in the tank, and Edmonton's penalty kill uh, made sure they stayed in it. And uh, otherwise, uh, you know, at at, uh, at five on five, this 
this was a very fast, very hard played game. Uh, not that physical, but boy, the Flyers just swarm, eh? And and they were uh, uh, they were constantly on the puck and and attacking with speed when they got a hold of it. And uh, uh, for Edmonton to handle that club five to two, you know, that's a pretty nice win, all things considered. Not yeah. perfect, but but nice. And you know, all told. Edmonton had 19 grade A shots to just 10 for the Flyers. And in the subset mm-hmm. of the most dangerous five alarm shots, it was 12 to 6 for the Oilers. So this was, again, another double, dominating double. performance by the Oilers. Bruce, what is your numero? Yeah, I'm just going to pick a strange one out of tonight. And that is a uh, total of 42 face-offs in this game. Uh, very low number of face-offs. And I just thought this game was played with speed and it was just... Fast, fast, fast. Like, I think the first TV timeout came at like 13 minutes into the first period because the only stoppages they were getting were, were icing or, you know, uh, ones that they couldn't go away uh, from the action. And so there was only actual 39 stoppages because, of course, you have three face-offs to start the three periods. And this is an exceptionally small number. This was a, a very high flow game. And that's one bit of information you can sometimes get from the face-off stats is that that number is really low. You know, the puck's just not stopping. And the whole game was over in two hours and 19 minutes, which would be right on the low end of of games. They, uh, they, they played a pretty, pretty fast game, and there was no video reviews or any of that stuff that takes uh, time out of it. They just play, stuck to hockey for the most part. Yeah, I like a I like a fast game like that. That was good. Um, yeah, usually what sixty faceoffs. Yeah, Maybe. more or less one a minute is 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 the average. And I mean, it does move around that quite a bit. And you often get to under fifty, but getting down around forty is uh, is fairly uncommon. So Connor McDavid, my number is a series of numbers around Connor McDavid's scoring. He now has fifty three points in thirty three games, Bruce. That makes him a third in NHL scoring. He uh, remains 10 points still behind the leader, uh, Kucherov, uh, 30, who's got 63 points oh, in, oh. in 38 games. So McDavid, um, I so just three he, games in hand. He does. That's correct. So in those three games, he could catch up. Being Connor McDavid, you never know. We'll catch up uh, some of it for sure. I, I think he will um, catch Kucherov, and I think McDavid will win the uh, Hart Trophy again this year. That the narrative, it, it, there isn't. I'm not hearing yet any com, like you know made up narrative like they did with Taylor Hall that year to enable a player to win the MVP award. I'm not hearing that yet. Um, a strong story or narrative about any single player that mm-hmm. is driving them towards because Kucherov's Tampa Bay, you know, that that's, that's not a great team anymore. Is it? I don't think it is. Um, uh, not, not as they were, you know, Nathan McKinnon will have a chance. He's having a great year and he's a great, he is a great hockey player. Kucherov mm-hmm. is, a, is a, is a great hockey player. Also is a bit of a jerk on the ice. So um, go ahead. I got, Bruce. I got this to say about Nathan McKinnon and, uh, this is from the other night in the game where they had a four nothing lead on uh, was it Arizona and lost five to four in overtime. And McKinnon had his goal and his assist and he extended his point streak and all that. But in overtime with thirty seconds left, he made the worst line change <laughs> I've seen in a long time. I tell you, uh, I just brutally just coasted off to the bench and uh, his teammate who was trying to get off had to turn around and come back but he couldn't skate that was Josh Josh Manson and Arizona just you know they had an extra man they took the puck hard to the net and managed to stuff home the game winner and this in a game that Arizona had led four nothing and I was counting on Arizona dropping two points and they came away with both points and McKinnon's play there was atrocious. I never heard a whisper about it anywhere, so I'm going to whisper Bring it up right now. now. Yeah. There you go. Well, that's yeah, that's the if, kind of if Dreisaitl did that, it would be you know it would be <laughs> all over everywhere. 
And he's been known to do that kind of thing. Well, this was one of those. And I'm thinking, hey, that's not our number 29 making the crappy line change. That's this big can-do-no-wrong superstar there in Colorado. Well, that's just an eye-opener that even the best of players sometimes screw up. I mean, we saw both McDave and Drysaddle with defensive mistakes in this game, but they're not the only ones who make them. Indeed. Yeah, so there's no one really who's standing out like the – Artemi Panarin's having a year, good year on a very good Rangers team. So yep. he might even be the front runner at this point. But we'll see how that, if that lasts. It's, you know, the season's still very young. It's not even half over yet. So there's lots of time for McDavid to make his move. And if he can get some distance between himself and the other point scoring guys, and if he pulls the Oilers out of kind of a historic um, crap show at the start of the year uh, for a good team, and leads him into the playoffs. I think he will win the Hart Trophy. He's got to stay healthy, of course. And so the other numbers that I have um, are, it's fascinating, his season, Bruce, his splits this year. Um, so he had, of course, the five-point game tonight. So, of course, there's the, he had, the, in his first three games, he had five points. So he started out okay. Then he goes, and, and he was, he clearly got injured somewhere in there. And he, he had an 11-game streak where he, he just had eight points. Yeah which for McDavid is like unreal, um, low production. Mm. Then um, he starts building up and then, and then he goes, there's a nine game streak where he puts up 24 points. But more recently, nine games, 24 points. More recently, yeah. just preceding this game, heading into this game, he had seven games with eight points. So he, and he has been playing well, really well. He's not hurt. Just you can see points, he's, yeah. he just wasn't getting any points. He was getting lots of, he was involved in lots of grade A shots. But sometimes that's how it happens. And tonight, he just he just burst loose. So um, hopefully this is a, a signal of another um, huge spurt of scoring from Connor McDavid. That would be most excellent. Well, the first goal he scored, which didn't even make our good things, uh, where... <laughs> yeah, what a goal. I come in two on two, and it winds up with McDavid skating backwards against the floundering, flailing Philly defender. And just sort of casually backing away from the guy and then firing a shot that uh, that somehow st- stick handles its own way through the wickets of uh, Carter Hart. But just a fabulous play. And after that, all he did was set up the other goals. Uh, Hyman from McDavid, great pass out, out of the Backhand corner. Backhand pass. After Dreisaitl no luck. made a great pass to McDavid that the yeah. TV crew didn't pick up on because they were too, too I mean, with reason thrilled by the spin around uh, backhand pass that McDavid made to Hyman. Uh, then the one we described where he set up Nugent Hopkins right in front on the power play. Then the cross ice feed that Dreisaitl one timed into the ice. And then another set up in, the, in to Nugent Hopkins right in front of that. Four primary assists. These weren't plays where the puck bounced off his leg and then two other guys touched and wound up in the net. These were plays where he was the primary driver. He scored the one by carrying the puck and finishing the play himself. All the other ones, he passed it directly to the guy who pounded it into the net right away. Just phenomenal. It was, it was kind of a Gretzky kind of night. Eh? Those, that kind of passing was very typical mm-hmm. of Wayne Gretzky. And uh, it was phenomenal. Every every mm-hmm. play that he, he got a point on was a phenomenal yeah, pass. Brilliant play, all of them. It really yeah. was. And the beautiful goal was uh, beautiful. It's so hard for the goalie. When someone's coming in and moving kind of laterally across the ice mm-hmm. and gets off a hard shot, that mm-hmm. is a tough shot for a goalie. They don't know. They don't. They can't judge the point <clears throat> of um, departure of the puck, I guess, where it's going to head. Mm-hmm. And it makes it very difficult on goalies. Well, if the guy is moving, the goalie's got to move with him, right? It's not like yeah. he can just stay set. He's got to put his weight on one foot or the other foot while he's sh- shuffling across. Gretzky was the master of that. He'd get the guy shuffling from left to right, typically, because Wayne would come on his forehand across the slot. And he would always seem to time his shot for just the moment when the guy's weight was on his left foot to go to the right, and he'd slide it right by his left foot and in the net, and the guy couldn't move his foot because his weight was on it. Uh, it, it. He did it so many times, it just was not, you know, it was clearly the plan, and the plan worked off. And, and uh, speaking of Gretzky and numbers, uh, Jason Greger had one today. He was mentioning the fact that Warren Fogel, in the last game, not only had five points, but he had five even strength points. 
and that neither McDavid nor Drysdale has ever done that in their careers. Uh, and the last order to do it was Sam Gagne in his eight-point game. He had seven even strength points. Well, the all-time list of Edmonton Oilers who have ever done it, it's been done 34 times by eight different Oilers. Wayne Gretzky, 22. All other players in the history of the Edmonton Oilers, 12. It's just one of those Gretzky. I mean, he played nine seasons here, and he had 22 games where he had five even strength points or more. <laughs> And there's just so many records out there where it's like Wayne Gretzky, huge gap, everybody else, you know, and it's, and he won scoring titles the same way, where, you know, between second and 10th would be this big bundle of guys and Wayne would be 70 points ahead of all of them. And it's just, he just, the, the, the magnitude of his records, they keep sort of coming out from the cracks with these little details like that one. 22 times he had five even strength points as an Oiler. Warren Fogle on a career night did it once. Very uh, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is quite a feat. So. Bruce, we are on to the final part of the podcast, the conundrum. Mm -hmm. And tonight's conundrum is we hear that the um, Sam Gagne and Dylan Holloway are, the coach, Coach K, says that they are ready to return this weekend. But the conundrum is where do you play them? And can they get in the uh, lineup? I'm seeing that, um, I, I just was on Twitter, I noticed Ira Cooper, I didn't listen to all of Stauffer's show tonight, but um, Ira Cooper, original Poozar on Twitter, yep. is saying that Bob Stauffer says that uh, Holloway, maybe he said this during the broadcast, actually, I, I don't know, but he uh, that Holloway looked awesome in practice. Um, Good. But he thinks the organization might do send him down for a conditioning stint, even though he doesn't need one for three games just mm -hmm. to keep the current lineup rolling. And mm -hmm. I don't see any real harm in that. He's a younger player. And um, you just say, hey, get, yep. just get get in some games, get get fully up yep. to speed. Nonetheless, he's going to be coming back, and Gagne is coming back. Both of them, Gagne was playing at a really strong level of two-way play, putting up some points at even strength. Um, Holloway is clearly, he had his two best games before um, he got hurt. I mean, Connor Brown's coming on. Uh, the clouds coming on. What do you do, Bruce? Where do you? What? What would you know? James Hamlin is and Adam Erne have played their best hockey in this current streak. Adam Erne's um, had some good games. Hamlin's, a, you know, a useful uh, fourth line center at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you do? Well, to. Um my understanding of the CBA, and I don't entirely trust my memory as I once did, is that to put a guy down on a conditioning assignment, he has to be on the roster. So they have to be paying him and, you know, they have to find room for his salary, even if he's not on this team and playing somewhere else. I see. So yeah. they would have to make a move for him. And it's just a matter of do you want him sitting in the press box or do you want him playing games in the AHL uh, or do you want him, of course, in the lineup? Uh, so they would have to move somebody out to uh, make room for him. Uh, Sam Gagne, on the other hand, he's already on the payroll. Like he got hurt, but he hasn't been. He's not on oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So his contract. So they only would have to make room uh, for the one guy. Uh, Adam Ernie seems like the logical uh, choice. Yeah. Uh, and the other option. Uh, which at least is kind of in Ken Holland's back pocket is James Hamblin, who's on entry level contract and his waivers exempt. So oh, is, he, is that right? Yeah, I didn't. So, I thought he was done with that, but that's interesting. Yeah. So he's he's the other option that they could, uh, you know, if they don't want to risk Adam Ernie on waivers, which he might get picked up. You know, he's been playing all right, but uh, yeah. uh, I I doubt it. Like it's just so much so little action on the waiver wire, but. Uh, uh, let's put it this way. He's covered the bet. Yeah, yeah he, he's, like he's, they signed the him out of training while. camp, NHL minimum. He's played 18 out of 35 games. He's averaging eight minutes a night on the fourth line, and he's been on for six goals, four and three against. You know, it's not like he's getting crushed out there. It's like when he's out there, not much happens, and that's kind of what you want with your cheap fourth liners. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, they're kind of the obvious choices and of course the other issue here is they've only got six defensemen currently on the roster 
So if they want to go on their next road trip uh, next week, they play three original six teams in Toronto, Detroit, and Montreal on the road. And I doubt that they'd want to go on that trip with just six um, defenders. Well, here's so one for you, Bruce. If they call, if Holloway comes back from mm-hmm. injured reserve, yeah. is there not some kind of clause where when someone comes back from who's been on injured reserve, to deal with the cap doesn't Philip Broberg have to come up for at least one day be- to get his bonuses in? And, and, and listen, I just I just have some vague recollection about the need, like at the start yeah, of the yeah. season. And yeah. it happened again. It happened again when someone came off injured reserve that Broberg had to be called it, up. It for. happened the day that they put Holloway on injured reserve. They called Broberg up. Oh, and, maybe they've covered and it. Now there. that he's coming off, I don't know that they have to do it again, but that's a question for our friend, original Pozar. Uh, it's certainly Ira Cooper, us. who's, uh, yeah. who's uh, much more uh, uh, on top of the CBA than I am. But uh, it's, uh, uh, I don't think you have to do that every time you're dealing with an LTIR move. But when you first activate LTIR, apparently you do, because they did have to do that this year, and they accommodated Broberg, okay. called him up. He played a game or two, and then he made one mistake, and out he went. And, uh, <laughs> so they, Which is literally like, true. <laughs> I think on the road trip, they would want it, whether it would be Gleason or Broberg. I mean, I guess they could say, well, we've got a day off between games every time. If someone gets hurt, we have time to call him up from from uh, Bakersfield, but uh, at the moment, they're kind of rolling the dice, you know, like if one of the D-men had come down sick this afternoon, they would have had to play with five because their farm team is not in Sherwood Park. It's in, yeah. in Bakersfield, California, the only team of the 32 that has their farm team in a different country than the, than the, than the main team. I think they could go with 5D, depending on who got hurt, like if it was like noose, nurse, uh, noose, <laughs> Their head would be on a noose. If it was Nurse, Bouchard, or Ekholm, you know, the big, big minute three. munchers. Mm-hmm. But they've got some guys, like Kulak can play more. Like, he, he can play mm-hmm. a lot of minutes because he's of his style of play. It'll, it'll be interesting. I guess Broberg has been doing very well in Bakersfield from all accounts. James I saw, he was really good. Yeah, so that's good. That's fantastic to hear. Mm-hmm. He is a fantastic prospect still. I don't care what anyone says. Um, I still I still have hope for him as a as an oiler. And um, okay. we'll see if someone gets hurt. We mm-hmm. can still see him this season play a big role in this team. And I'd love to see him coached by Paul Coffey. I think that would might really – to see him move mm-hmm. like he can on the ice mm-hmm. instead of having shackles on him. Like, yeah. Um, we want you skating and moving. We want you skating and passing and making plays, yeah. joining, the, joining the attack. And, uh, he can do all those things in, in my view. Could be sweet. So. Yeah, Philip Rober, he's he's a word that you only ever hear applied to prospects and real good ones. He is toolsy. He yes. has many tools of the trade, you know, in terms of, you know, just raw skills that you think are translatable or I think are translatable to the big league level. I think it's originally a baseball term, but yeah, prospectophiles everywhere use it. He didn't play well in the NHL this year, but last year in the NHL, he did play well with Evan Bouchard. So mm. um, there's that too. So uh, yeah, I've still got a lot. I've got some hope for that player, quite a bit of hope for him. And as an oiler, um, if well, someone well, gets I, hurt, they're going to need a sixth and he's the best bet. Like Ben Gleason oh, yeah. is, is, is a good choice. If you're literally here to sit in the press box, I'd rather have one of those 25 year old guys doing it than the 22 year old. Uh, you know, just needs ice t- ice time and reps that he's now getting in Bakersfield. But I think if it came to any sort of scenario where the Oilers were down a D man for a while, uh, Philip would be the guy. Yes. To call up and him playing well in Bakersfield is uh, is just what we wanted to see and hear. All right, Bruce. Uh, the next game is Thursday. Yeah. Oh, one more thing on our conundrum. Uh, when those guys come back, where do you put them? Like, Holloway well, play wing or center? You see, if you keep McLeod at, um, if you keep McLeod on the wing, Holloway was an excellent center in college hockey, mm-hmm. like excellent, and he looked mm-hmm. like a center. 
So it might be an interesting third line to have him with Connor Brown and Evander Kane. This isn't a checking line. This would be a third scoring line, third two-way line. And um, Connor Brown is looking to me like a like a decent NHL player again. Like I, I, I'm optimistic, more optimistic than I've been in a long time that Connor Brown is going to try. I was worried that he was never going to, but I, I think he is going to. And Evander Kane, if, as he gets healthy, healthier, he's missed the game due to injury. Like they're, they've both been fighting injuries this year. So those two guys and Holloway, the injury line, um, there's a, that's a lot of talent. And it'd be interesting to see Holloway be given a chance at center before you trade for a third line center. Be interesting to see if Dylan Holloway could fill the bill. Um, it's about the same age that Ryan Graves was when Ryan Graves became quite a useful playoff performer for the Edmonton Oilers at center. On your fourth line, then you'd have a check. Your, four, your fourth line would be a checking line with Matthias Janmark, who is the best defensive winger on the Edmonton Oilers. Never gets credit uh, from it from a large group of fans. They don't. They just see him as a useless player. But he's, he's an outstanding defensive hockey player who's actually can attack. Uh, now and then, just not much finish. Oh, finish. Uh, Man, he yeah, tonight he had a great chance. Oh. If he just hold the puck a little longer, he would have gone yeah. around the goalie. Right? Yeah. Anyway, so there's him, him, Ryan, and maybe Hamblin or Gagne. Is you know, it's Sam oh, Gagne is a fifth forward. Isn't a bad idea, right? Like that's a great, that's a great extra thirteenth uh, forward to have on your team uh, in Sam Gagne in the regular season and have him ready to go in because he can fit anywhere in the lineup. Sam Gagne. And um, so he'd be the guy who might be sitting because Hamblin, I think, has earned a job, Bruce, and they, they're going to need a center. And um, now, would they be comfortable with Holloway and Hamblin as their third and fourth line centers? Maybe not. But, you know, if Holloway comes back in January and he gets a run of games and things start going well, there's nothing like success to change a coach's and an organization's mind. And they might decide they don't need to trade for a center because that's the, to me, um, well, it's either a goalie or a center at this point. And um, they, they, I don't think it's clear. Yeah, well, it's, a top, it's either a 3C or a top six winger. And I think depending on which position uh, McLeod is playing will determine what they're looking for. Uh, I, I, the only fine-tuning I would suggest is I would put Ryan with Holloway and Kane as a as a – Strong defensive player who also has the ability to fill in on the face-off dot, especially, you know, on the opposite side to Holloway. That maybe let the kid take, you know, his strong side and let the old man take the ones on his strong side. And between them, you're going to fare a little better than if you're counting on some 21-year-old to take all of the face-offs and, you know, all the dots on the on the sheet. So, and, you know, Brown right now is... is uh, Getting by as a you know fourth liner, he's not scoring much, but he, you know the fourth line isn't yielding a whole lot either. Yeah, Kane, Kane isn't and isn't going to be a strong de- defensive player. Um, it's he, not really his game. It's not his focus. Right? He can make big plays, but as a, yeah. you know, as a consistent sort of uh, defensive winger, not really. And no. Whereas Derek Ryan is pretty reliable in that uh, in that respect, so that's why I don't like to see Kane and Drysaddle together. Like they're and, two guys who have the similar proclivities, and I just don't. It doesn't work because of that. And so unless, like Leon, I think I still have hope he's going to change his habits. Kane isn't going to, and um, I mean he's he's, he's only thirty two. <laughs> he's not gonna. Um, uh, like you say, he makes big plays. He's a, he he uh, he can help your team win because he's ferocious and he can score. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's not going to be an extremely mm-hmm. disciplined uh, defensive player. So anyway, I don't. I I think he he probably will, and he, I could see him sticking on the third line much of the rest of the year. Um, of course, that can always change. You know, um, maybe he'll play with McDavid. He'll go with. Um, Nugent Hopkins, McDavid, and um, Kane, perhaps, or something like something like that. Anyway, yeah, I so I I think um, they will both get back in the lineup when they when they're healthy, though, because they're both of them really good players. Gagne, though, more in a spot role, I'm guessing, uh, until unless someone gets injured, and there's always injuries, so. Yeah, as always, people banged up at least. 
And, uh, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. how Sam got his chance in the first place. Was that some of these other forwards were, uh, were, were missing time and they wound up signing him and calling him up. And once, uh, you know, when Brown got hurt there, you know, they, he started getting a regular game and he kind of held the job for a good long time until he himself got smashed in the face. See, it might do well for a guy like Kane. Let's let's say Kane has a groin problem and a nagging groin injury, which is slowing him down, which I think is seems like the case. Just if if to give him like let's say two weeks off, um, let's say the the break, the All Star break, and then the week before to the week after, and just give him some real time to heal. And but I don't think players like that. They don't want they don't want to come no. out of the lineup. They don't want to they want to keep sticking. They want to. Kane, what Kane wants is to work his way up to the top line again. And if not that, the second line. Yeah. So he's the, he would not be too keen. Well, Evander, we, we're, we're getting ready for a playoff run. We'd like you to miss. Just have a seat for a week. Mm-hmm. I think he'd be awfully suspicious. And prob- his instinct might be correct. You just never know what's going to happen. And once you get out of the lineup and some guy steps in, he might start scoring. And all of a sudden, well, uh, you know, we're going to extend your your press box time another week. Now I don't think that would happen with a Vander Kane because he, he, he really will that... <clears throat> he really will help in the playoffs. And I know mm-hmm. there's this faction of fans who doesn't like him and doesn't like his play even. They just they just they there's not not one thing they like about a Vander Kane except maybe that he pops in the odd goal. But this is a very useful player in the playoffs. And and he's the kind of player what he brings but some of it's good. A, yeah, he's the kind of veteran. Like, if you go back and look at history of the NHL, like go look at the Toronto Maple Leafs in the '60s, and how some players didn't do so much in the regular season, but how they cranked it up in the playoffs, and suddenly became close to a point per game player again. These guys in their '30s, and I think there, everyone uh, is going to be very glad that Evander Kane's with the Oilers in the playoffs uh, this year. It's my guess. Well, not everybody, but most of us. Yeah. Well, in a seven game series, he brings a different element. And, uh, you know, uh, let's just say uh, his absence was duly noted against the Kings the other night. And the Kings were trying yeah. to push themselves around that game. The Oilers did, you know, eventually get the job done, but they were a little bit on the back foot for a while. And what Kane, one thing Evander Kane doesn't do is back off. <laughs> he does not. <laughs> he does not. <laughs> that is so true <laughs> yeah. and that has value yes. your team can't get pushed around I mean you got you want to stay within the lines and you know not not cross the line by doing something dirty to uh-huh. to uh, you know seriously bad but uh, you know it's uh, it's hockey it's a tough game out there and you you got to have uh, uh, you got to be able to at least hold your own ground and the orders with Evander Kane are a lot tougher team than without him. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, when you mentioned that, like it just, the game of Thrones popped in my head and all those ferocious <laughs> swordsmen in those, in the game of Thrones, you're like, you know, just no back and down, totally, totally confident mm-hmm. and attacking ferociously. So that's a Vander Kane and, and uh, he, he, he can be a very useful hockey player as Matthew Kachuk will attest. Bruce, let's leave it there for tonight. Thanks for talking. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.